Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Good morning, good morning. College football recap, week number four. I didn't say preview this time, so at least we are starting off on the right foot. There we go. Chris, how are you, buddy? I'm doing well. It's a, you're, a, you're on location, aren't you? Yes, sir. In Cleveland, baby. Cleveland, in the Ohio. land. Ohio. Yes, sir. Getting ready for the Browns and the Rams. I can, I can get with it. All right. We got a lot to discuss. First off, though, show always brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. They have got six wonderful sports books. You can go check out more information about them over at tunicatravel.com. You can find more information about us at winningcureseverything.com. We had uh, what you would call a rough Saturday. Oh. Ooh. Oh. That was bad juju, man. That was uh, that was other <laughs> level kind of stuff. I that I got some bad beats yesterday. <laughs> uh, some of, some of mine were bad beats. Some of them I just didn't deserve to win, and they weren't close. I was the two point conversion screwed me in two different games. Coaches have learned to do math, yeah, and and they start going for two earlier. And when you've got dogs, and Vegas is really good at getting the point spread right. That tends to help the favorite more than the dogs. Yeah. The the Oklahoma State game for you was a travesty. Uh, UCF, In the Kansas game. Kansas I mean, game, it's... same thing. And West Virginia for me, went for two, one by five. So, Man, it, it, me losing that Washington State game last night after – after Washington Washington State losing that game last night. Just period. But, we but scored 10 that, touchdowns. I had – I had a minus 18 and a half. They were up by 32 with six and a half minutes left in the third okay. with the ball. Like, like, what are we doing? I don't so, know. All right. The, we'll, 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 for nine touchdowns. We yeah, can get we'll, there before we'll get we start. It. We'll discuss it. We'll figure this out. We'll walk our way all the way back through it so that right. I can, you know, a little therapy session, I guess. Well, um, let's start off our starting 11 with number one, Georgia 23. And Notre Dame 17, this was an instant classic. Now, before I say anything else, am I crazy or was that pass interference on that last Hail Mary on the fourth down for Notre Dame? It was 100% pass interference. And I don't think you're giving Notre Dame the game by calling it. Like, I understand swallowing your whistle because you don't want to decide the game. But you call that. It's not a touchdown. It doesn't end the game. It doesn't change the game. It just keeps Notre Dame alive. Yeah. That's but but it, it absolutely was pass interference. And it's okay, so I'm not I'm not nuts here. I mean that no. was just no. you're talking about two guys that picked Georgia that didn't think Notre Dame would be in this thing, but that was pass interference. That was, yeah. it just was. Uh Georgia had three hundred and thirty nine yards, Notre Dame had three hundred and twenty one yards, two hundred and seventy five of which team. was passing. Um look, Georgia wasn't dominant. Because I think Notre Dame schemed really well. They've got, like, their defense is not super big, right? They're not going to be able to go man for man with Georgia's offensive line. But it was obvious they had some quick dudes. They were filling in gaps very quickly, and they were hiding it. And it was a fantastic game plan. Brian, by, this by might be the, and that bunch. Yeah, sorry, I don't mean to overstep. No, sorry, I apologize. Uh, th- this might be the best team that Brian Kelly's had in this run, and and they do look good. It's and it's a shame that, yes, it's a shame that people just assume, oh, they've been blown out before when we let them in, and they can't hang with the SECs and the Clemsons of the world, and so they don't deserve to get back in. Those teams are not this team, and they absolutely deserve to be in the conversation with the rest of these guys. I know they've got one loss on them. And, and there's a lot of teams that are undefeated. Yeah, this shouldn't teams. make them fall very far. There's a because lot of, a bunch of those teams, teams at Georgia. You damn straight they would. And, and there's a lot. That atmosphere last night, everybody was like Georgia by a million. Yeah. When that game started, it was just around the world unanimously. I mean, I'm talking professional betters that don't get into hype and they don't give in to atmosphere and those types of things were like add 10 points to this point spread. You, you can't beat it. This is going to be unbelievable. And not only did did Notre Dame like hang with them early, they led early. They controlled the game. They held Georgia to nothing 
offensively early. Yeah. I, yeah, I was so were, impressed with Notre Dame. Loved every second. Of, and Georgia, obviously, they're the winners. They looked really good, too. I think Notre Dame had one bad quarter where they let Georgia score a couple of unanswered uh, points, and, and it got away from them. Yeah, that was the third quarter. I think the, the total yardage was like 200-something yards to 18 in the yep. third quarter. One quarter, they got yeah. dominated, and it was the game. Yeah, and that was that determined the whole thing. Yeah, uh, they now, won the, the other three quarters. The fourth and one call – Late in that game, where they decided to kick the field goal, yeah, uh, I don't uh, explain this to me. How does that make any sense? You're already up by two scores, and you kick a field goal to go up a, a little more than you know. It, I it's think, two scores. I think like, it's just one of those situations where you're Brian Kelly. You've been housed in all of these games. Well, no, this I mean, this was Kirby. Like this. Was, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because like, um, Kirby at fourth and one, they're up twenty to ten. What what part of the game are you talking about? This was uh, like early fourth quarter, mid fourth quarter. Oh, okay, oh, yeah. After yeah, yeah. they went on so, that run in third quarter, where, where they're they're down there, and you've got a chance to to go up really twenty seven to ten. You got a chance to dominate this thing, and instead you. Well, even if you don't get it, you still pin Notre Dame back pretty far. Exactly. And your your defense hadn't hadn't given up many drives. I mean, it's been a low scoring game. I don't. You I don't know how I feel that. about you know how I feel about Kirby and in game coaching during big games. I, I think there's not another coach that has won as much as him and as highly praises him, whose butthole tightens up more than anyone else's, and he makes mistakes. If you can get him stressed in games, he will give you the game. Almost gave him the game last night. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely did. I was I wondered in that situation because of, you know, it, everybody thought he should have actually punted against Alabama last year. Uh, it just it, some of his more aggressive play calling in the past has bit him, but that's because it was such a odd time to do it. But last night, uh, fourth and you one, you can't look at that fake punt that he ran against Alabama and say it's an odd time. But like that's a moronic thing to do. A, it's just yeah. stupid. Even if it worked, it was still a dumb. Like yeah, that doesn't help you win the game. Completely different in a tie game as opposed to you're already leading and it's fourth and one. Like put your, fourth put and put one different on the road. Yeah. And so it just just ridiculous. Georgia did look good. Notre Dame did look good. That was a a real deal, big time college football game. I was impressed with both teams. So, and, and, and not listen. The quarterbacks that are going to come out in this draft this year might, might be the best we've ever seen in the history of the NFL. I, I have pencil. I have personally have penciled in Tua to be number one overall to be the best quarterback. Am I? Am I just overlooking Fromm? I mean, he looks so. He just doesn't make the mistake. When, he doesn't when, make mistakes. Um, he doesn't make mistakes. But he, but he also, like you, you want a little more. Like there's, so he can make his his back shoulder throws. He can make his uh, his crossing throws. He like all of this stuff. He's he's got a little problem with like some touch passes here and there. Everybody does. I get it. It's. Like I think he's probably a top five, top ten pick. I don't think he's as good as Tua, and I wonder. I think he's a better decision maker than Justin Herbert, right? Oh, so, I do too. And then after that, uh, who else is coming out this year? I mean, those are the top three, right? Well, like Joe, no, Burrow. Joe Burrow's going to come out, and yeah. Jalen's going to come out. I'm a, I'm going to tell you if if Jalen continues to do what he does, and he can do it in the playoffs against some of these big boy teams that he's going to have yeah. to play. He does it against Texas. Like, what what Lincoln Riley is doing is just there's there's no check you can cut him big enough. If you're Jerry Jones and you win the Super Bowl this year, I still fire Jason Garrett and offer him ownership in the team. Just just give him just give him ten percent of the team, which is worth like a billion dollars, and and just say, come on, just come on, we got this. Yeah, no, you you're probably right. I don't know, man. Kellen Moore's doing pretty good out there. So, um, are you right to get rid of Kellen? Oh, yeah, to get rid of Kellen. Lincoln, Lincoln, just listen. What Lincoln is doing? Those two together is is magical. What Lincoln's doing, I've never seen before. This this quarterback class and Burrow's the throw in 
because up until this year, he's never done anything close to this. But how much of that was system? Like, we didn't know he could do this because he because never he had system. the opportunity or the chance. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm he's, he's the throw in, and his numbers are better than everybody else's. Yes. I, I, yesterday was ridiculous. I didn't put it on here. Um, I know you didn't. I knew you. I knew you weren't going to. That's okay. Well, it's, but hey, I got two. I didn't put can, on. Can I throw in an LSU out. thing? Just, just real quick. Just, just real quick. I got two stats for LSU. Two stats. One by ten a.m. They had already drank half the bars on Broadway out of vodka. That's true. And before the end of the game, they had already drank the entire uh, stadium dry of all the beer. When I read, when I read stories like this. Is it bad that it makes me feel like such a proud papa to know that? No, that's, that's, that's not bad at all. I, I that's not that you I'm so I'm so proud of them. I'm so <laughs> proud of them. All right. Well, speaking of proud papas, let's move into number two. <laughs> let's talk about Wisconsin because I know you're proud oh. of your boys up there in whiskey. Yeah. Thirty-five yeah. to fourteen over Michigan. Jim Harbaugh. There are some real deal questions at this point. Wisconsin is a hundred percent legit. Uh, Jonathan Taylor had 23 carries, 203 yards, two touchdowns. That's 8.8 yards per carry. Um, 359 yards rushing on this Michigan's defense. And that's that's a legit Michigan defense, yes. people. Now, I know that we we are crapping on Michigan, talking about how overrated they are. That defense is not overrated. No. Wisconsin's front line moved them around like they were children. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's the time of possession. Wisconsin had it 41 minutes and seven seconds. Um, Michigan had it 18:53. Michigan had four turnovers. Wisconsin zero. That's the kind of stuff when we talk about efficiency metrics, et cetera. It it has to do with success rate, correct? Turning the ball over, et cetera. Those things do come into play in these situations. This game got out of hand quickly. Yep. It was a, if if Michigan had been able to hold on to the football and not turn it over, and you know even at that point, even if you are getting physically whipped, you can stay in a ball game and find a way to make it, you know, at least competitive. Here's the thing: thing. I don't I don't know that you can when a team like Ohio State or yeah, like Ohio State or Oklahoma is is out running you. And they're doing it with the pass. There, there are ways for you to get lucky and to to have a couple of things go your way and kind of hang in that game. But but you you and I have talked about this many, many times. When a team just physically manhandles you in the trenches and they run it down your throat over and over and over and over and over again, it it does so much more than just get yardage. It, oh, yeah. It devours the clock. You talked about that. Oh, that's, but I it, don't know if you it, saw the videos uh, of the Michigan team like running out there middle of the fourth quarter, running yeah, out. Yeah, but the, they they but had quit. It they, was yeah, so well, it makes you. I was just about to say it. It breaks teams' will. It yeah. really does. I, I've I've watched enough football to know when the, the best Alabama teams of all time are, are not the ones that you have now, where they're putting up 50, 40 points yeah, this is a game. Not, it, it were the ones where they just lined up and then just pulverized you from the front lines back. And, and there's nothing you could do about it. It didn't matter how you scheme the defense. It didn't matter what guys you rotated out there, what defensive front you played, play nickel, play down, play 4-3, four, three, play 3. It doesn't matter, 5-2. It There's nothing you can do when an offensive line gets a hold of you and just has their way with you. It breaks your spirit. It breaks your will to play. Yes. It makes you want to quit. And I don't know that that makes me question Michigan's toughness. I think this Wisconsin team is more real than, than I could have ever imagined before the season. This is the style of football I love so much. It's one of the reasons I grew up loving LSU. It's This is what we used to play before yes. we found an offensive quarterback. And what we have now is fun. But I just – I remember watching old-school Wisconsin games where they put up 500 yards on the ground on people. Okay. This is that. That is a real team that Michigan has with real NFL players. Nobody the rest of the year will do what was done to them yesterday. Oh, Nobody. I, I agree. Now, I know other teams may score a bunch of points. They won't do it like that. They won't – they just – it just won't. That won't – they won't get manhandled yeah. in another game. 
No, not not the same way. Like it, they might get outscored because their offense sucks and they just can't find their way. Yeah. I, I said it on our preview show. I think they needed to go to shape uh, to uh, to to McCaffrey and they need to bench Shea. I think he waited way too long yeah. in this game to bench Shea. That was that was a a major league mistake. That was waving the white flag, is what that was. Like that's that's all that was at that point in the game. Well, yeah, because you but McCaffrey came in and and had a couple of big drives and scored some touchdowns, got some points on the board. That still, I mean, not great numbers. wasn't super efficient. Oh, well, but, but that defense is incredible. I mean, he yeah. he was. I'm not saying he he would he was he just looks better than Shea. I just as soon as you know you've got a losing hand, you fold it. As soon as you know you've got a loser, you fold it. And I, I I'm I, curious if they're going to go back to Shea. You know, the next I would go not. round. I would. I personally would not. At, at this point, I mean, I, it does it. It may not even matter. Like that's that's what situation they are in right now because it there people are. I think Harbaugh could leave for the NFL after this season. I think he is. Oh, I do too. But I also think he could salvage this season if they roll it, off the rest of the the rest of the Big Ten's not that crazy. Um, you roll off the rest of the Big Ten and you just gear up for the game and. Find a way, I, Jesus Christ! You got to find some holes in Ohio State. I have no idea how this Michigan team would ever hang with them, that's but a, that is that is a rivalry that. game. Yeah, and and if you can find a way to win that game, and you finish this season with you know one maybe only two losses, and you beat Ohio State, all that happened yesterday, and also the thing that's going to help them, and we'll get off this game. I know we spent way too long on it. <laughs> Wisconsin's going to do this to everybody. Yeah. Okay, when when Iowa rolls in, they're going to do it to them. Okay, yeah. everyone on their schedule, they are going to physically hurt their feelings. You know how much I love Iowa. I, I know. I don't. I don't know. I do too. That. I do too. And I love that uh, that defensive line. My my guy is a D line coach, Kelvin. I can't help you. I got nothing. I got no answers for this, I, dude. I'm I'm all over Iowa whenever that spread comes out because that like I love Wisconsin. I don't know the really number. Good. I'll I'll take Wisconsin. But I, I don't know the number, and I don't care. <laughs> they treated you grown men saying. like children yesterday. Yeah, I mean it was it was ridiculous. And they're gonna do it again next week, and the week after that, week after, and, week after, and, and, and every week until the season's over. Yeah, they yeah. might be the best team in the country. They might be. They might be. We'll talk about our top ten at the end of this as well. Uh, let's move into the next topic. Pac-12 after dark. And I had this way down on my list at first, but this morning I felt like this deserved to be uh, up to the A the block. Top. Yeah, this needs to be in the A block. Uh, so we got two games here that we'll talk about. Okay. UCLA 67, Washington State 63. And then on the back half of this, it was Colorado 34, Arizona State 31. Because what this did after, you know, we also had another topic here, but the only undefeated Pac-12 team as of September 22nd is the Cal <laughs> Golden Bears. Yes, sir. Every other team in the entire Pac-12 has a loss. Arizona State goes to Michigan State, comes home and gets beat by Colorado, who lost last week to Air Force. You've got uh, UCLA, who has looked like complete trash for three weeks. And... Washington State is up 49 to 17 with six minutes left in the third quarter. You know how bad this hurts, right? And, oh, I, I know it's killing you because you are a, a leech guy, but I, I had money on Washington State last night because, look, I cannot stress this enough. UCLA was like number 119 in yards per play allowed and like 127 out of 130 in yards per play on offense. But they ain't that no more for the for the yards per play on offense. Oh, no, no, no. They, now they allowed a shitload of yards. Yes, they did. <laughs> uh, look, Anthony Gordon had nine passing touchdowns last night for Washington State it's and lost insane. the game. This is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. It it just it, – so it was 49-17 to 17 with six minutes left in the third quarter, and – UCLA drives right down the field and scores to make it 49 to 24. And that is when everything went crazy. Washington State 
fumbled a ball after after a pass, and it looked like it may not have been a fumble, but they didn't review it. They didn't, or they did review it, but they held it up because they couldn't figure out the uh, indisputable evidence side of it, whatever. So UCLA scores on the very next play. Yep. And then Washington State gets the ball back. They have to punt, and they give it right back to UCLA, who returns the punt. Who, I mean, it's just, you had a 100-yard kickoff return for a touchdown. You had a 69-yard punt return. You had six turnovers, four of which were fumbles. Like, I am just, Washington State gave away that game last night, and it irritates me to no end. Now, once Chip Kelly saw some blood in the water, that was the old Chip Kelly. That was the Chip Kelly that absolutely took advantage of the situation and went out and let his quarterback have fun, right? Like, that team looked like they were having fun. They were hitting everything in stride. They could do no wrong. Is this the Chip Kelly that we get for the rest of the year? I, I don't. I can't answer that. I, I just... You know, I'm not a stats guy. I like watching these games. And then afterwards, I look at the numbers and I see, does the numbers tell the story of the game? Got, got, a, tell the story. Got, got a couple numbers. numbers for you. Got a couple numbers for you. This, this is, I mean, it's laughable. It's laughable. Yes. Gordon, 41 of 61, 570 yards of offense, nine TDs. Nine, Gary. Are you insane? Hang on. But not not to be outdone, young man. <laughs> Robinson, 25 of 28, 507 yards, five TDs. We, we had a total of 14 touchdowns. There was 1,377 total yards of offense last yeah. night in this game. That's the most asinine thing I've ever seen. There are going to be SEC teams that won't have 1,300 total yards when the season is over with. <laughs> That's ridiculous. That's yeah, the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. Like, and, and we saw it in four hours. I thought, because I was also watching Colorado and Arizona State at the same time, I thought there was like some pretty good offense going on in that game. You had 475 yards of total offense from Colorado – and you had 453 from Arizona State, and they were going those back are, and those forth. Those are kiddie table and numbers. That's 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 nothing. That's nothing. That's nothing. To Washington those State are, those are jump numbers. So it both We're almost 1,400 one yards. So it, Washington State is is proof that if you do not win the turnover battle, you are probably going to lose the game. Negative five for a turnover margin is inexcusable. Like that bunch. Did not know what they were doing. They completely folded. Like once UCLA started coming back, and it drove me insane. But my Twitter feed is full that, of how stupid the Pac-12 is, and I that, so, I love it and I hate it. God, I hate this conference so much. That was, that was a seventy-something over/under total for that game. They doubled it. Yeah. They almost doubled the damn thing. Yeah, that's just ridiculous. What was it this? was UCLA spectacular was not to watch. To score. Well, like, Chip like, Kelly, be damned. He, he heard you talking all that noise last week. He said, you know what? No, nah, this shit stops now, today. Well, Chip, like as long as you're back to being yourself, I'm down with it. But uh, if you're going to come out next week and, you know, get your quarterback fumbling and throwing picks and not knowing what he's doing, like, don't don't give me that noise. Like, I, I'm just – I'm so – I'm so tired of it because they look like complete garbage for the first three weeks. Everybody thinks, oh, my God, they're <laughs> yeah, just rigged. It's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. Yes, because I'm, I'm thinking, like, okay, I've got Washington State minus 18 and a half. They're up by 32. So if UCLA scores two touchdowns, well, then we'll only win by 18. And, you know, maybe it'll go back and forth, but, like, I'll at least win by 18. I just need – a little more. I need one more touchdown, and then it goes haywire. And no. oh. haywire is not haywire. Doesn't even come close to describing how this game went. Oh, Here's the thing: I'm I'm not a coach. I, I, I've never been one. I don't understand all the nuances of watching film. I have no earthly idea what those coaching staffs are doing this afternoon. What, like, what are they even looking at? Well, what are you still looking? Sleeping for? right now. Well, I'm just talking about this afternoon. Obviously, when they get up. 
Like yeah. what, what, what on earth are you looking at? Well, we put up about 700 yards of offense. Not really sure how we lost this they're, game. Uh, they're, they're probably discussing how to hold on to the football without fumbling it. Because that was ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, that's irritated me to death. All right, let, let's talk about more Pac-12 after dark crap. Um, we got USC and mm, Utah Friday night. Um, from Friday night. Third stringer Matt Fink shows out, and Graham Harrell, I think, is the best assistant coaching hire in college football this season, period. Matt Fink was 21 out of 30. 351 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. Uh, the passes consistently floated, and receivers had to come back to some of these passes. I don't know how much of this game you watched, but they, they had to turn around and like actually adjust for them, which is really difficult for defenses to be able to adjust to. Right? That's right. You A lot of pass to, interference calls. Yeah, so like Slovis <laughs> really – has some zip on the ball. Like he can throw the ball really well. Fink throws a different kind of football. So Very when the receiver, yeah, when the receiver's allowed to adjust for it, it completely threw off what they were used to doing. Now they were able to get some pressure on USC. You know, they were able to dominate, not maybe not dominate, but they had some success against that offensive line. USC had 22 rushes for only 13 yards in this game. Like, That's Utah football, though. It's Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, time of possession, Utah had the ball for 38 minutes and 12 seconds. USC had it 21 for 40 or 21 minutes, 48 seconds. USC had two turnovers. Utah had one turnover. Like, everything on the stat sheet tells you yeah. Utah should have won this football game. And yeah. it kind of started the, the trend of, oh, the Pac-12 is going to really do this this year, huh? Okay, like, they're, they're going to just end it early. Like, it, it's cannibalism in September. Like, instead of waiting until, like, like, late October, November, like, let's just wipe everybody out early. That way, Larry Scott doesn't have to think about it, right? And so, yeah, this was this was an interesting game to watch. Did, did you actually watch it Friday night? I didn't get to see much of it. I went to the Indians game when I got to Cleveland. Right. Um, but I, no, I, and I watched a lot of the highlights. I looked at the scores. So you started this off with Graham Harrell. Yeah, and and I think I was thinking about this after this game. Um, he's doing such an incredible thing there. With a let's not kid ourselves, USC's got talent. They probably have the most talent oh, yeah. in the Pac-12. Maybe Oregon's got a little bit better than them, but but they got a, obviously a better quarterback. But I mean, you have a seven to three deep at quarterback. Okay. One guy goes down, the next guy's not much worse than him. Maybe better. Then that guy goes down. I was like, well, holy crap. Maybe this guy's maybe better than the other dude. <laughs> like, who, who knows? My question is this. If you're Graham Harold and you see how much success you're having, would you rather – Clay Hilton gets fired, whatever. Saves his job, don't know what's going to happen there. If you're Graham and some big monster school comes after you to be their OC and they pay you a couple million dollars – do you continue to stay in OC where you see you are just a raving success? Or do you try your hand again at being the head? Because there are going to be schools that are going to say, holy crap, man, this guy didn't lose anything. He was just kind of a pain in the ass to deal with. But but we're, we're fine with days of football coach. Let's, let's bring him in and give him a shot. Do you try your hand again at, 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 the, at the head coach? Now you're talking about Graham Harrell? Yes. Well, I mean, when when was he a head coach before? Wasn't he at Arizona State? No, you're thinking about uh Todd um good gracious. Graham Harrell was the uh Where'd Graham come from? He came from North Texas. But let's see. Hold on, I'll I'll tell you. Because he's one of the air raid guys. He was one of Leach's guys. Um I knew he was under that tree, but I thought he had a head coaching job. 2009, he was a quality control coach at Oklahoma State. Then he played in the NFL for a little bit. Um, he was a backup at the Packers, backup I at knew the that. Jets. Um, he came back. He was a, uh, let's see, 
offensive assistant and wide receivers coach for Mike Leach in 2014, 2015. I, I knew that. I thought he, after that, I thought he left for a head coaching job. Nope. He was the offensive coordinator at North Texas from 2016 through 2018. So why did I think he went to? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but Todd, completely a, uh, completely different person then. Yeah. Todd, Todd Graham. Graham. Todd Graham. There you go. That's all right. That's who you're thinking. The name, Todd Graham. The name, Graham Harrell, the name, I get it. Yeah, the the names cross this just like she is a son of a bitch. Um, okay, I thought this was a different person the entire time, even though I've seen his face. I know who he is. Yeah, no, this this guy's young. Like, he's, well, then he's I absolutely young. would give him a head coaching job. Yeah, no, I, then, I agree. I mean, I, I then yeah, I, this guy, this guy next year is going to be a head coach somewhere. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. I mean, You're one hundred percent. This has right. been absolutely bonkers to see USC doing this. Um, now I don't know if it's going to last because I mean they do play Washington this next week and then they have to play Notre Dame and you know but, but in his after, world his world he just needs the offense to stay great doesn't well, matter I, after that point like you're if you lose both of these games you've got three losses right so you're you're sitting at three and three if you lose both of them correct but after that I mean it's not exactly like a ridiculous schedule. So like it it's feasible they could end up like nine and three eight and four oh, yeah. and yeah. while I well, they're still USC man we start this by saying they they've got more talent than everybody else for the most part yeah. in the past I, I don't know that eight and four saves Helton's job but I don't know we'll see let's uh let's move on we're taking forever on this I'm sorry uh, no. next next topic up Pitt thirty five UCF thirty four. And I'll I'll go ahead and, and parlay this together with the Thursday night game with Tulane 38, Houston 31. But let, let's talk about Pitt and UCF first. Pitt jumps out to a 21 to nothing lead and looks dominant. Uh, Man, for 21 points and a, and a half yeah. in three years. I mean, it's it, but they do this every year to somebody. Right? To somebody, you're right. And it, it, it almost always happens at Pitt. Now, we had the one year at Clemson that was – a little crazy, but yeah, led twenty-one to nothing in the second quarter. Pat Narduzzi was actually aggressive in his play calling, um, and this was for like the entire game. So I, I had this on one screen. It ended the UCF twenty-seven game regular season winning streak, which Pretty is incredible. That's absolutely incredible. That's you know longest regular season winning streak in the country. Uh, that was. That was fun to watch. I mean, UCF came all the way back. I, I don't know that Dylan Gabriel is quite there yet, but he is – I don't know that they'll lose again in the AAC, but that was an absolutely incredible game to watch. Agree. Like, I completely agree. The final play – and you're right. Like, I, I fully – watching this game, I just didn't believe that was Pat Narduzzi on the sidelines. Like this is yeah. this is he's been he's been taken over by somebody else. It it was it was strange because this did not look like him at all. And the only thing I can think of is they were just sandbagging the first three weeks of football, and they were just like, we don't care if we lose these games. UCF's going to come in and we're beating them, so let's just throw away the opening three weeks of the season. And then when UCF gets here. Well, look, I'll, I'll make some dumb call at the end of the Penn State game that nobody can make rhyme or reason as to as to why I did what I did, and, and everybody will be wanting to put me in a straight jacket. But when UCF gets here, we'll we'll open up the the the, the, the playbook and we'll show everybody what we're really about. <laughs> that's, that's the only, only explanation you get, right? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. That was that was insane. Um, now, to parlay that with this, I told you last week. <laughs> you did? That I did, I had heard several people talking about this, and it was people that I had not heard talking about it before that said that Tulane had the most talent in the AAC and that they were going to cover the spread against Houston and that they were probably going to win the AAC this year. And just talked about the, it so nonchalantly, like it was the just... The most talent in the AAC is so hard to swallow. Uh, yes, uh, but but apparently this has to do with, like, transfers that come in. You know, their quarterback is McMillan that came from LSU. Like, yes, sir. They've got four- and five-star grad transfers that don't equate into the recruiting rankings. Mm -hmm. And 
they got dudes. Like those lines are absolutely legit. Tulane wins that game 38 to 31 over Houston. Houston was up 28 to 14 at the half. Yes, sir. And comes out the next quarter or next half. Houston puts up three points. Like if you heard Dana Holgerson talking after the game in his press conference where he was like, you know, I look at all these stats, you know, the better team didn't win tonight. Like the the most simple stat in the world is yards per play, and Houston lost that by a full yard for the yep. game. It's Dana, what are you doing, man? <laughs> you had a chance to to wrap this thing up. They're up twenty eight to fourteen at the half. And Tulane comes out and just drives it methodically down the field. They're running the ball. They're throwing the ball. They're making these outstanding plays. McCleskey, the wide receiver, is a speed demon. But the fake kneel down. This offensive coordinator, Will Hall, at once upon a time, Ole Miss did not want him to be their offensive coordinator. That's that's just, Gary, that's just like, not true. It, it, no, it's, it's not true. true. It's, it's absolutely not. true. He's he's coached at North Alabama. He coached at Louisiana Lafayette. Like he's and now he's over at. Tulane. He was on the list of people that they were going to interview, and he took himself off the list. Hey, you you following along with Fletchy? I, I see where you're coming from. Where are you so, coming from, Gary? Because I'm coming from a whole different land of of truth and reason. Okay, <laughs> and who wrote this truth of reason? <laughs> who told Gary this truth and reason? That's, I can't reveal my sources. Come on, man. That's a, which. Hey, by the way, by the way, I don't know if you realize this. Do you know who Ole Miss is at? Not that this was supposed to be an Ole Miss conversation, but do you know who Ole Miss's interim athletic director is? No. Do you remember Keith Carter? Like the the guy that used to play basketball at Ole Miss that wore like the knee high socks, like at when when they got beat by Valparaiso and the. No, anyway, well, he's the interim athletic director, which was blew my mind when I saw that. Um, we'll actually talk about Ole Miss here in just a little bit because so you know, so you have a booster great. that said I really want this guy, and they ended up not hiring him, and so therefore they didn't get you know didn't want this guy. That, That's yeah. it. well, that, he that was, makes sense how you follow that logic. Ole Miss was the one who didn't have job that he was up for. He never got interviewed. That's it. He was on the list of candidates to interview for the job, and he never interviewed. Either way, that wasn't supposed to be a big deal, but apparently we turned it into a big deal. Well, you took a shot, and I have I have the obligation <laughs> to to stop and say, hold on, you're just taking shots for taking shots. And okay, we're not you got a point. You got a point. That's fine. That's fine. Either way, Will Hall with the fake, uh, the fake Neil, that was absolutely ridiculous. And then the I the – throw at the end of the game to McCleskey, who now you watched this on Thursday, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The throw when he caught the ball, he still had to run like 20 yards. And the Houston defender is running step for step with him and never tried to tackle him. Did that seem a little strange to you? No, I I, I will tell you one thing that, all right, <laughs> Creative all you want. We do live in a world of player safety, all right? And we live in a world where when teams are kneeling the ball, when the defensive team is like that dick that just like is still fighting and whatever and yeah. like, come on, man, just let them kneel the game. You you got beat or we're going into halftime, whatever. I don't like the fake kneel because the defense is, is taught if they are conceding, you concede. Yeah, and and if you see them going up, and you see them going to kneel, the, the DBs aren't trying to cover. No, no defensive player is is on the line is being aggressive. And you can say, well, that's their fault. They should be playing till the whistle blows. Also, but when they play till the whistle blows, they get fifteen yard penalties thrown on them, and teams start fighting because, dude, we're trying to kneel it. You know, yeah. that's, it a I, I I don't I don't call that creative. You call them sleeping in a in a situation where. They're supposed to like they've been coached at every level now. When a team is kneeling, you can see if you got beat, you just got beat, and that's just the end of it. And if it ends the game, it ends the game. If it ends a half or whatever reason they're kneeling it, then then that's just the end of it. Yeah, I can understand that. 
But other than that one play, no. An outstanding game by Tulane. This was the one team we didn't know anything about. We didn't know what to expect when starting this season because, A, we had no clue about how to grade these grad transfers and how to evaluate them. And then the other thing is – The chemistry between Hall and Willie Fritz was going to be. That's it. We had no idea. Willie Fritz has done nothing but run this triple option, and they were wanting to find some blend between spread, air raid, triple option. And we were like, how the hell is this going to work? Yeah. And we thought it could be confusing. We thought it could be complicated. And and whatever it is they're doing to communicate to these players, they've picked it up. They've learned it. Too late, pretty good school. Maybe these guys are pretty smart, and and they're figuring this thing out, and they do look good. Now you are you are so right about that. All right, let's move on to the next one. We'll kind of run through, we'll run through these fairly quickly. SMU forty one, TCU thirty eight. SMU is for real, and TCU is in some serious trouble here. SMU only two hundred eighty eight passing yards, which you would expect for them to pull off an upset like this. They would have to have something crazy happen. But no, TCU two hundred thirty six rushing yards. TCU fumbled the ball three times. SMU through one interception. TCU quarterback Max Dugan, 16 out of 36 passing for 188 yards, but he had three touchdowns. Uh, TCU has had six turnovers in three games. That turnover bug continues to haunt them, same as it did last year. It was uh, an entire season of that last year, yeah, just 12 they, games of just being awful. Well, and, and not effective passing the football. Now, you can run on, on SMU. Some of these... Big Twelve teams, you're not going to be able to run on. Mm, I don't. I don't know that. I, I don't know that I believe that. It's some of them. I would PCU say has them. ran on everybody for years. They've only had a couple of years where they had like a big explosive passing game. They run the football and play good defense. There's nobody in the Big Twelve that I think they can't run on. I think Iowa State would give them fits. I think that be uh, Baylor would give them fits. I think Texas has a pretty good D line right now. I think Oklahoma's D uh, like I, I think. I think there are people that they're not going to have as easy a time moving the football on. And I don't think are, they're going to beat many of those teams, but yeah, but I don't I don't issue. think it's going to I don't think it's going to be because they can't run on them. Either way, they are they are in trouble this season. They're in trouble if they if they, they, they continue to fumble the football. They're in trouble. Yes. Uh, moving on from that, Auburn twenty eight, Texas A and M twenty. The legend of Bo Nix continues to grow. 12 out of 20 for 100 yards passing. One touchdown. He had 12 carries for 38 yards. Uh, he got the very last first down to kind of end the ball game. Auburn only had 299 total yards. Um, and Texas A&M actually outgained them 391 to 299. A&M only had 56 yards rushing. If you watch this game, they should have gone away from the run early. Move to the quick passes, They, but I understand where they were coming from. You want to be able to establish something with the running game to keep you safe. When the game honest, wasn't out of hand. Yeah, I mean, they were they were playing from behind all day because they gave away points. Just that they missed a field goal <laughs> early. They right. fumbled on their own 38 and, and gave away points all day long. I mean, they were down 21 to 3 after the first drive of the second, uh, second half. Yep. So, you know, yes, you have to pass the football in that situation. But, my goodness, Kellen Mond looks so much better. And, you know, you've got one of your star running backs out for the year after the after the Clemson game. You should have known you were going to have problems against that Auburn defensive line. And they didn't adjust and they didn't adapt until, really, it was too late. I mean, Auburn, there were spots where A&M could have made this a ball game. And while it did get a little entertaining late in the ball game, uh they had a chance to to really keep it close early, and Auburn. I mean, that was about as good a game plan as you could possibly have. Auburn like, looks exactly like every massive defensive, not defense, just SEC team that we're used to. Yeah, Georgia, Alabama, now LSU has um, turned into offensive juggernauts, running spreads and and quick up tempo kind of stuff. Auburn still looks like old school SEC. We are going to play great defense. You're not going to run the ball on us, and we're going to run it down your throat. Yeah, it's a, they they generate rushing yards, right? Like it's it's not rushing yards the same as you know we're going to 
run it in between the tackles all the time. Yeah. Like, they find ways to get those end of rounds, like the first touchdown that they had that was, you know, a 50-some-odd yard, 59-yard, 60-yard touchdown run that was like a, a double reverse kind of looking thing, right? Like jet sweep, but hand off to somebody. Yeah, that's Gus Mouse on play calling, Exactly. Though. So they generate rushing yards. They find ways to do that. So and, – And they do that because the offensive line is massive and super athletic. Yeah. So – um. All right, so we are running super long. Let me see if I can uh, if I can get us through this. Yeah, Texas see if we can roll. their losing streak to Oklahoma State. Um, you watched that one last night. Tell me your thoughts on that one. Mike Gundy was super conservative. Mike Gundy, which I've never seen in my life. He settled for field goals over and over and over and over again. Yeah. I think they only punted once or twice in the entire game. But they were getting outscored as soon as Texas touched the ball because they get two field goals. Texas gets a touchdown. They're still leading the game. Yeah. The, the then they get another field goal. Is. Texas scores a touchdown. And then they trade touchdowns for field goals. And you can't win the game that way. Uh, the, the, the difference in the score was Gundy kicked two field goals inside the 10 yard line. Yes. And that was it. I mean, you That's lose it. by six at that point. So Texas 498 yards, Oklahoma State 494. So, of course, it was back and forth. It did not hit the over. Um, Ellinger, 20 out of 28 for 281 yards, four touchdowns and a pick. He had 10 carries and 70 yards. Uh, the story was Keontae Ingram, really, 21 rushes for 114 yards for Texas. So they, they do have a running back. They look okay. Uh, um, yes, they do. O- Oklahoma State's going to get ran on by everybody. Well, yes. Yes, Spencer Sanders, fantastic numbers. 19 out of 32, 268 yards, two picks. He had 18 runs for 109 yards. Um, and had one touchdown. And then, of course, Chuba Hubbard, 37 carries, 121 yards, two touchdowns. This was back and forth. It was Big 12 football, and it was really I, fun to watch. I think Chuba Hubbard's the best running back in football right now. I would go with Jonathan Taylor. Uh, it's it's easy to say that. I would like to see them switch offensive lines, and let me see what we think. You might be right. You might be right. I, I don't don't get me wrong. What you know, I love Jonathan. You know, I love Wisconsin. But let let me put Chuba behind that line, and 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 let's let's see how he does because Oklahoma State's offensive line is good. They're not great, and Texas is a real defense with a real defensive front, and and he he did really good last night. Still, yeah. No, I I do agree with that. I do agree with that. All right, let's move on from there. The plight of second year coaches. Let's uh, let's give our rundown here. San okay. Jose State 31, Arkansas 24. Ooh, that was rough. Uh, Florida 34, Tennessee 3. Cal 28, Ole Miss 20. So we, we are including Matt Luke in with the second-year head coaches. And Florida State 35 to 24. They actually did okay. Arkansas's Chad Morris. 4 and 12 overall in a year and change. Three losses to group of five teams at this point. Uh, two of them at home. 0-9 against the SEC. San Jose State had 503 total yards. That was atrocious. You're going to have to keep talking. I'm down to 5% of my battery. Give me a second. <laughs> keep running. Keep running. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so, Jeremy Pruitt, 6-10 and overall in the last however many years, uh, or a year and a half. Florida absolutely – dominated Tennessee. I I don't – this smells like the end for Jeremy Pruitt. Um, I'll let Chris talk about it here in just a second. Cal 28, Ole Miss 20. This one could have gone the opposite direction. It looked like Ole Miss scored at the end of the game. The Pac-12 officiating crew has had some major league troubles in the first few weeks of the season, of course, with the missed call against Michigan State, uh, against Arizona State in the Michigan State game last week. And now with Ole Miss possibly scoring a touchdown with no timeouts left, with about five seconds, six, seven seconds left in the clock. Um, yeah, there was some some interesting stuff going on there. Uh, and then Florida State, 35-24 to 24 over Louisville, which doesn't sound great, but they were up 21 to nothing. They went down 24-21 to 21 in the fourth quarter and found a way to come back and actually score two touchdowns to end the game as opposed to what they've done basically every other game this season, which was not be able to score in the fourth quarter and give up way too many points. 
Sure. So, all right. Where would you like to start? You want to start with Chad Morris or Jeremy Pruitt? Yeah. Or- Chad, Chad Morris, we thought that he'd found his quarterback. Still think he has found his quarterback. Uh, they put up 500 yards offense. Doesn't matter. That but team they gave up 500 yards offense. The team is still really bad. And I, I don't know how long you give a guy to, to rebuild. My, my problem is not, I can't give you three years. I don't, I don't like the idea of just firing guys willy nilly, but I also think I don't see next year being any better than this year or last year. Yeah, and, and if it's not going to be, then why just give you the three years just because, well, we got to give you three years to build your team and this and that. Like if I know that bringing in a crap load of freshmen next year aren't going to change this, then then what what good does it do to 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 keep riding with this thing? I mean, you yeah, you're right. And 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 I can literally mimic that exact same conversation for Tennessee as well. As as soon as you know you have a losing hand, you fold it. You just have to. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Now, I don't know about Willie Taggart. Um. I see. I do. You beat up on Louisville, but you've looked bad against everybody. And there's chaos in your locker room. There's chaos on your team constantly. Like nobody seems to get along. There's no cohesion in anything. Even if you roll off a couple of good wins, what does it mean long term? I mean, do you really think the program is getting better? No, I don't. Are you just? Or you just eventually just you're going to out athlete dudes and beat them. Yeah, I I think I mean you're right. You're going to out athlete some people, and it didn't look like there was a lot to be. I, I think maybe we're at a wait and see moment to see exactly because Louisville has been really well coached. Like Scott Satterfield knows what he's yeah, doing. Yeah, they've been well coached, but they still can't win games. Yeah, that's kind of because they don't. I mean, they're in a. This is not a knock on him. They're in a complete teardown. Yeah. No, you're right. So, I mean, that's that's the difference is is he's 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 in a situation where he's got he's starting from zero. So, and and you look good against him, great, congratulations. If you don't, then you're fired. If you do, it doesn't make doesn't mean anything. What does the the loss to Cal mean for Matt Luke? Do you think? I I don't know that it means anything. I'm I'm telling you, I, I they made some coaching mistakes in this game. But they found once again, guy goes down, and it, it you find somebody better on the bench. I have no idea what's going on with the backup quarterbacks in this world and why these guys aren't starting. But every time you seem to change starting quarterbacks, the new guy looks so much better than the old guy. I, I can't can't put the math together on that. Um, and maybe that's a coaching flaw. Why are these coaches not able to pick this stuff up in the off season? And there's spring practices and all these other things. Or it could have um, to do with the defense is preparing more for one style of quarterback as opposed to. Because eh, I don't know that I believe that. So go, I, I mean, think defenses. I think USC. defenses are taught to to play receivers, offensive line, running backs, and the difference is is yeah, if you go from a pocket passer to a running quarterback, you're absolutely right. But if but if they're both pocket passers or they're both running style guys, then then I don't think that matters. Like. This guy touches the ball and that guy zips it in. Shouldn't change the way you play defense. Oh, yeah. I mean, you may be right. You may so be anyway, right. Um, but I I don't think Matt Luke is long for this job to begin with. I thought he was going to sit there and take it until um, the sanctions were over and and be the good old Miss guy and get paid for for taking that one on the chin. Yeah. Um, I I still think I still think that's in play. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, look around the SEC. I, I just don't think – I think there's some bad coaches in the SEC, but I also think there's some really good coaches that still struggle to win football games. We both think Mark Stoops is one of the best coaches in the SEC. But at Kentucky, he still doesn't have the resources. It's still a basketball state and team. And, and it's just – they're going to be hard to be really good or great consistently. If Mark yeah. Stoops is still one of the best guys out there, if you're old Miss, you, you got to find a good guy if you want to get out of where you're at now. No, I think you're. I think you're exactly right. You are exactly. I mean, they they obviously need an AD first. They need a chancellor. They they need the people that are going to hire the people. So I think Matt Luke is probably fine for right now. Um, 
but yeah, just uh, another loss to add to the list of losses. Uh, but Arkansas. I also think Cal's really good. That's why I, I don't agree. think that's a knock on them at all. No. Cal's one of the best teams in the land. They deserve to be in the top 25. Well, I mean, they're, they're the only undefeated team in the Pac-12 right now. <laughs> and they've got wins over on the road at Washington and on the road at Ole Miss. Yeah. They, I mean, legit. this is – Look, their schedule is a hell of a lot harder than a lot of other undefeated teams. That's, I, I should have put more money on Cal to uh, to win yesterday. I thought the heat was going to really affect them because it was hot as hell in Oxford. Had yeah. a lot of people texting me saying, "Man, if they could play in this, they're a legit team because it it is it, it is warm. bad. It was um, absolutely warm, and it it did not seem to affect them at all. No, no, I'm I'm Will Cox is a is a dude. He's a beast, man. He's he's the real deal. Like it, they they found enough offense to be able to uh to get that game. I would throw any amount of money at that guy if I didn't have a head coach that I loved already. It, I would I would hope that he would be able to find a different offensive coordinator. Um, because if he wins games, Cal. do you care? Wait, what? If he wins games, do you care? No, if he wins games, of course I don't care. But uh. Going to to bigger schools and whatnot, like it's, I don't know. You you can go seven and five at Cal and be perfectly fine. Um, you do that year after year, you turn. But he doesn't have the though, talent right? at Cal that he will if he goes to a bigger school. Yeah, I mean you you might be right. You might be right. Right right now right now I'm gonna and I don't know if we're gonna get to this team or not. Right now. I'd take him at Nebraska over a guy I really like, Scott Frost. Scott Frost, an offensive guy, his defense could take over a team like that and keep them in games and win a lot more games than bringing in an offensive guy where the defense is just a sieve and you got to hope you outscore people. I I did not put Nebraska on this list. Nor should you have. Nor nor should you have. Because this is a starting 11, not the ass end of the 11, okay? Exactly. Uh, Because that – game against Illinois last night was just whatever. And the fact that game day is going there, like I, I, uh, it's just a damn shame. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get Felica on with us this week so that we can, I love Felica. so that we can discuss it. But, uh, yeah, that was, that's a, that's a strange decision. That's an odd that's one. A, that's a money decision. That's, uh, yeah. I mean, you, you're probably right about that, but they do have a rule. Like they try not to go to anybody that's coming off of a loss. That's, so, a, that's a bad rule. You know, I, it's, if Michigan loses week 11 and Alabama or Auburn loses week 11, you mean to tell me you're not going to the Michigan Ohio State game or the Iron Bowl? Come on. Come on. Yes, well, you are. They Let's go know. see Clemson, South Carolina, because it's Clemson won. Like, that's, a, that's, a, that's a bad rule. It's well, a bad rule. Visit a team that because Utah of course playing Washington State well I mean both of them lost but both of them lost I get uh, it but Utah lost and they're at home so like the fan base maybe not as no the fan base like, is going to be just as jacked well the the other side of this is the the slate for next week got a little bit like less exciting because of all of these you know last minute losses last night um but it it also makes it where like ABC was already going to Lincoln for the game like they, they're broadcasting that as their primetime game because that's fine State. that's okay it's going to be a 30 point game so yeah and you you and i have talked about this uh the alabama Ole miss game is the 230 cbs game so it's going to be a 30 know, point game as well yeah that lets you know that there's really not that many congratulations good- this you was got a, you this got a 30 a point fantastic there. weekend like for a slate of ball games that's right. And then next week we'll be back to uh, and yeah. the week after that we'll be okay. Like we'll we'll have these weeks sometimes. Um to wrap this up before we get into our top tens, I had to shout out the boys. The App State Mountaineers, as you can see, pull off the upset. They go to Chapel Hill, they get the win over Mac Brown and the Fighting Tar Heels. Man, look, this was not as as simple as I thought it might have been. I thought they might have had the better offense. I thought they, you know, it, head coaching might have been similar, you know, all that. Like, I felt good about this game going into it. I actually bet App State plus three and a half last Sunday when the line came out. 
I didn't give it out as one of my picks because as the week went on, more people were betting App State. More people were giving them respect. I thought, okay, well, maybe UNC doesn't look past them towards Clemson next week. Maybe they realize, oh, these guys are still in our state, and this is a legit matchup. App State is really good. They blocked a field goal on the final play of the game. It was a 56-yard field goal that would have tied the game. They blocked that. UNC had three turnovers to one. Uh, North Carolina outgained Appalachian State 469 to 385. Like, this was, looking at everything other than the turnovers, this was a That's pretty it. even matchup. Like, but, but, but we talk about that all the time. Turnover is the ultimate equalizer. Yeah. You win the turnover battle, you win the game. And North Carolina lost the turnover battle. They, they had two interceptions and one fumble, and Appalachian State had one interception. And that was two it. weeks in a row. Mac Brown takes a team that's hot as fire, and, and everybody's talking about them, and they lose to in state competition that, for the most part, big picture, not as hands. big, lesser, yeah, lesser programs without question. Yes. A, a small private school and a former Division Two A school. Yes, like this is, and, and both those oh, programs are good. Both yeah. those programs are much better than they've been. So this is, yeah, no, it's, it's I'm not, not saying say. they're nobodies. Like, we all know who they so, are. But both of these teams are still undefeated. That's that's right. That's so, right. <laughs> can't say that for the Pac-12. Hey, yeah. man, North Carolina recruiting's got to be tough. It's got to be tough in that yes. state. Because no, like you don't have an Alabama or an LSU or a Clemson saying you're not getting out of the state, but but you do have a whole bunch of schools in the state. You got a lot of schools that are all competing for the same dudes. Yeah, it's not like we run one style and so we're going after a different caliber. But they all run the same offense. Yeah. They all look the exact same. I mean, you you got Duke, Wake Forest, North Carolina, North Carolina State, App State, and then all of the the little bitty schools, and then you've got the big schools that are trying to go in there and get players like and get Clemson, dudes. Tennessee, yeah. Georgia, et cetera. South Carolina's got to get Carolina. their kids. Like it's North Carolina is a battleground, man. It it really is. Like I was thinking about that when I was watching this game yesterday. I was like, God, man, could you imagine having to recruit in that state? Like that be your home state to try to pull kids out of? Oh, it'd be like it's not like Florida or Texas or California where you don't have to you don't have to get on an airplane. You could just roll out of bed and find 12 four stars or three stars that probably should be four stars and, and say, All right, you guys get on the bus, let's go. Let's go. You you just send out a couple of text messages, they're there in 30 minutes because they all live right there. <laughs> I mean, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, like those are different. Like we put out a ton of athletes here in the South. Georgia, yeah. same thing. But we don't have this kind of demand. You're losing them to big boys because there's a bunch of five stars. You got a crap load of three stars coming out of North Carolina, and everybody wants them. Everybody wants them. No, you're God, right. It's insane. You are right. All right. Before we get into our top ten, let's talk about this really quick. I, I want to give like a, a running schedule of this or a running tally of this every week, and we'll just oh, do it quickly. God. You don't have to. Strength of schedule. Now, I'm not going to look at the, the analytical number yet, but I just want to talk about uh, Texas A&M, who lost again yesterday. They are the toughest team on Clemson's schedule, right? So Georgia Tech, who they played first, lost last week to the Citadel. Texas A&M loses at home to Auburn. Syracuse had a battle with Western Michigan. Clemson beat Charlotte yesterday. Now let's run through. North Carolina loses at home to App State. That's who Clemson has next. Florida State sitting at two and two. That's who Clemson has after that. Next up, Louisville, who is sitting at two and two, who just lost to Florida State. Boston College, a team that got boat raced by uh, by Kansas at home by twenty four. They get them at home. Then they play Wofford. They play at NC State, who got boat raced by West Virginia. Then you've got at the very end here. Wake Forest, who is currently sitting at 4-0, and there's a realistic chance that you could get Wake Forest to 9-0. and 
There's a there's a legit. Oh God, I can't live in that world. I can't live in that world. <laughs> like, how am I going to talk to my kids about a nine and zero Wake Forest? Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Know, I don't know how to explain that to people. That's. A, I guess your kids weren't born yet when Jim Grobe had them like playing in the Orange Bowl and everything, right? No. That's a, when was that? Oh, seven. Yeah, I'm. I'm a. I'm a 2011 oh, father. That was the 07 year. Yeah. That was when everything else went haywire and Wake Forest won the ACC. <laughs> yes, the craziest year in college football history. Oh, man. My Tigers won the championship that year. Yeah. Chaos be damned. That, that, that is the Baton Rouge sense. voodoo. Les Miles wins a national championship Listen, that hey, year. If you don't believe in voodoo, go back and look at 2007 and yeah. tell me it's just not real. Just tell me it's not real. It's I'll call you a liar. And, and then, of course, Clemson wraps it up with a visit to South Carolina who they have dominated here recently and uh, looked terrible at Missouri yesterday. And I they're just looking worse the worse. Kentucky They look State good against in a fight against Alabama. They got their brains beat in, yeah. and then they yeah. just look awful at Missouri. Yeah, just awful. Just awful. All right, you want to roll through uh, your top ten? Yeah. So right. do you want to start? Right. Now, we, we, we do, I do this differently. You and I used to. I don't know how you're going to do it. But the way I do the top ten – is I only look at what I have seen. That's exactly okay? how I do it. I, I do not care about preseason numbers. I do not care about, you know, this team is big and so they're supposed to be good. I look at who you've played. If you've played a good team, top-ranked team, you got wins against those teams, you are ranked higher than if you're undefeated and you got wins against nobodies. So That is a with little all, different than how I do it. Here I'm, I'm doing it based on – what I have seen, because not everybody has gotten a chance to play. Everybody, right? Like they're big. That's their fault. That's their fault. Hey. These teams make their own damn schedule, Gary. Your boys picked Duke. You hand selected Louisville last year. Okay. I'm not. Here's what I got. I'm not even talking about Alabama, but that's okay. <laughs> no, no, this is what I got. Right, go I think I think the best team in the country right now is Wisconsin. I think they have the best resume in the country. They they beat the hell out of a team that I think is still pretty good. Do I think they're a top 10 team? No. But do I think that defense is legit? Yep. And they broke their will. They broke, they hurt their feelings. And, and I don't think that's going to be the last time they do that. I think they're the best overall team from top to bottom in the country, Wisconsin. Okay. Second team on here, based on resume alone, LSU. They beat the hell out of everybody they've played. And they've got a road SEC win. I know it's against Vanderbilt. Georgia scored 30 against that Vanderbilt team. LSU scored 66. Okay. Okay. And they went to Austin, Texas in a monster game. On the road, hostile environment. That win alone might put them over Wisconsin. Their defense doesn't look nearly as good as Wisconsin's does. They get that. Number three team. This resume might be the best. Not might be. It is the best in the country right now. That is the Auburn Tigers. They have two top 10 teams that I thought when they played them were really good wins. Neither one of them were in Auburn. They played them both, one neutral site, one on the road, and and this is the best resume. They look like a great team with a quarterback that is doing just enough to keep them in games and nothing to lose games. He's played so smart, so slick. Number four. The most dominant team, now they've played nobody, but they have murdered everyone is Ohio State. It, it, I ha- This is the one team that I have that hadn't played anybody that I have really high because they are taking no prisoners, and, and, and I am very anxious to see them get into some better competition. I don't think we're going to get it this week against Nebraska. I think they are going to – I don't know that they can make the line big enough. Yeah, I agree. Last night's win, Georgia against Notre Dame, that is a for real Notre Dame team. I think that was an incredible win, great atmosphere, and and I think that's a super complete team. Next two teams, they played nobody, but they look good against everybody. One of them looks way better than the other. That's Oklahoma. I think Oklahoma is incredible. I think Jalen Hurts is amazing. And I love I love watching this team play. Other than that, I got Clemson. I think Clemson is a 
Great team that's going to have a disastrously bad resume, but they do have a win against Texas A&M, and I think Texas a and really good, which is why I have them over Alabama. Bama killing everybody they play. Their offense doesn't look unbelievable like it has, but I think they're holding a lot back right now because they don't have to. I think their defense has given up points to some of these teams that I don't understand how or why, but once again, that could easily be because they're just holding everything back because they don't need to break out the playbook and they could easily be the best team in the country, but I can't give it to them with this resume. And then after that, I got two one loss teams over a bunch of undefeated teams. Still, I got Notre Dame still in this thing. That loss to Georgia last night was the most impressive loss that anybody has on their resume. And it probably going to, if they go undefeated with that being the only loss, Man, I know that they've been embarrassed in the past. I don't think Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, LSU, Auburn, Ohio State, I don't think anybody embarrasses them. I think they hang with everybody. I don't know they beat everybody, but I think they belong in the conversation with everyone. Okay. And then my last team, I think Oregon is still really good, and I think they have a neutral game, last-minute defeat against Auburn, who I think is an incredible football team right now. And and I can't leave them out of this. I, yeah, because I one think Oregon team, should have won that ball game, a hundred percent. Yeah, they, so, I mean they controlled the majority of the game. If you want to fault somebody, fault Mario. Yeah. But that team, that team is really good. That's my top ten, and 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 I'm sure it won't finish that way. But I'm gonna tell you this, Wisconsin. But as of right you, now, yeah, I'm with you. It makes my heart smile watching this football team. I have. Basically the same thing, only in a different order. Okay. Uh, and I'll roll through mine quickly. Number one, I've got Ohio State just because they are ridiculous right now. Like, and it's it, what I was saying is mine isn't based just on resume on whatever. It is based on holy crap, how good are you, right? And those other three teams I have above them just have wins that you can't take off the yeah, resume. No, that makes sense. Those are incredible wins. That makes sense. Number two, I've got Georgia. Uh, while they didn't look dominant, that is a legit Notre Dame team. So I, I'm all in on Georgia here. Number three, Wisconsin. Uh, number four, LSU. Number five, I've got Clemson. Six, Alabama. I've got Auburn seven, Oklahoma eight, Notre Dame nine, Oregon ten. That's how I roll through mine. And a lot of the reasoning is similar to yours. I think everybody in the top ten right now, they every, every one of them could beat everybody else. Yeah. Right. I could I could see Oregon beating Ohio State. I could see Georgia beating Alabama. I could see Notre Dame beating Wisconsin. I could see like there's a lot of different ways that this stuff could go depending on where the game is, etc. And I think they're all pretty damn good right now. And I with their schedule, Auburn and LSU could finish with two losses pretty easily. And I don't know that that takes away from them. Auburn, LSU, and Alabama have the toughest road to hoe out of all these teams. Oh yes. And, and it's not close. You, you want to talk about strength of schedule. Those three teams, A, have to play each other. They still have to play A&M. Auburn's gotten through them. Yep. Auburn played Oregon. LSU um, uh, played Texas on the road. Yeah. Like the, These teams, when they're done, here's what's going to suck. Two of those teams are going to be so far out of the conversation because they're going to have at least two losses based on the way just – I mean, I guess it could be a three teams finishing 11 and one. And you look at tiebreakers after that, um, if they beat each other, but that, that shouldn't discredit or hurt them. I know the sec is not the dominant sec that it's been in the past. Yeah, but the, the middle the tier down really, really the good. top, the top four teams in the sec. And I still love a and I still think they're real good, but that schedule was brutal, man. Yeah. And the then LSU, the next level uh, down. A and M could easily beat LSU and Bama. They just could. They, they could. They're I'll good tell you enough. This to do though, that. That if you had the under seven and a half for Auburn, uh, and the over seven and a half for Texas A and M, that game yesterday flipped everything. Flipped everything. And I had both of those. I had Auburn under seven and a half. I had A and M over seven and a half. I think I have the over on both of those guys. Yeah, you, you had the I'm over. On gonna, both. I'm probably going to push one and lose one. I uh, lose one and win one. So I'll push yeah. on that. So. <laughs> But yeah, it, it flipped the the narrative on the SEC rankings, and 
Whew, it is going to be a wild year, man. I, I am so excited about this. We got, we're got we through four weeks. I'm ready to go watch some NFL stuff. You ready to get out of here? Yeah, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's uh, let's first off, tell everybody, go over to winningcureseverything.com. Uh, check out all of our social media stuff over there. Check out basically uh, everything over at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe to us on YouTube, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Leave us some comments. Leave some five-star reviews for us. We do appreciate those of you that have done it. We will uh, we'll read off a couple of them on the show on Tuesday. Uh, yeah. Go to tunicatravel.com. Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. They have got incredible stuff going on down there. Tunicatravel.com is where you can find out more stuff about it. Chris, we're going to do the NFL recap on uh, Tuesday, right? Yeah, man. I'm all in with it. Guys, enjoy your Sunday. Enjoy your Monday. We'll be back on Tuesday. Whew, and I am pumped about it. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.